Okay, so we t I'd explain that there's uh, about 12 or 13 lectures, hours of lectures on solid state joining. We're going to start with fusion welding, but to start with fusion welding, um, I like to, in the MIT spirit of things, go back to the fundamentals. Um, if I were to take a piece of metal, any piece of metal, and heat the surface of it, what I'd like to know is how many watts per square centimeter I put into the surface. There's lots of different heat sources and in fact at the beginning of the course that first module when I talk about the importance of welding I point out that virtually any new heat source that someone discovers one of the first things they do is they try to use it to make a weld. When Sir Humphrey Davies discovered the electric arc in 1805 or thereabouts one of the first things he did was try to weld with it. Okay. One of the first applications, the first commercial application that I've ever heard of with a, a laser was repair, General Electric repairing vacuum tubes in the mid-1950s. I mean, the laser had just sort of been invented, but back, back then they didn't have high power um, transistors and stuff. They used vacuum tubes. And some of these things were very expensive, costing hundreds of dollars a piece back in 1955 or $56. And sometimes they get a bad weld in those little components in the vacuum tube and they'd have to break the seal, fix it, and then put it back together. They found with the laser they could go in there and they could hit that little post of tungsten or molybdenum or whatever it was and they could cause, cause the, the joint that had separated, they could cause one of them to get soft and if they did it with gravity as their aid, they could cause the two to hit touch one another then they go in with a higher power pulse and they could weld them together without breaking the, the vacuum seal in the glass because the lasers would go right through the glass right if they had the right kind of laser and right kind of glass um, a few years ago in the early 90s like 92 or 93 the Naval, Sur Naval Surface Warfare Center had spent some time about a quarter billion dollars worth of time trying to develop a particle beam weapon and this was going to be the new phalanx system that you shoot down the incoming Aegis missile or whatever right on a surface ship for a surface ship protection and the idea is you could shoot relativistic electron beams out there 30 miles and they go at close to the speed of light and the incoming missile you'd hit with this high power pulsed electron beam and they built these units up in, down in Dahlgren and up in White Oak and stuff and at some of the national labs. And then peace broke out with the former Soviet Union and all of a sudden they had this technology. What do we do with these pulsed power relativistic electron beams? And so they had a three day workshop. They invited me to come down and see, help them understand whether they could weld nuclear submarines. Okay, because they saw Navy work, right? Let's apply it to welding submarines. So I got down there and I looked at what they had. They had megawatts of power. And I said, well, you might be able to melt a submarine, but I'm not sure you could weld it. You only need about 10 to 100 kilowatts to melt to weld. And you've got so much more energy. So I'm not sure this is really going to be useful. Plus, it gives off radiation, x-rays, to beat the band. You have to have like two feet of insulation, OK, radiation protection. And you can't just clear out the whole shipyard just because you're going to start welding a joint. Okay, so I had to explain some sort of practical things to the scientists. But nonetheless, what I did is I actually used something that I learned in 1977 and when I was a young faculty member. And that is you can put all... Ooh, what's going on here? Uh, upper base off. Well, that's okay. Okay, you can put all fusion welding processes on a one-dimensional graph. So here's one dimension. I told you I keep things simple. One-dimensional graph. You get to the management school, you're going to learn about two-by-two two matrices. That's as complica complex as they get. But anyway, this goes from 10, to 10 squared watts per square centimeter up to a million watts per square centimeter. And it turns out a regular old flame <coughs> Oops, I got to turn it on. I need new fuel. 
that's about 100 watts per square centimeter. And I really don't want to leave my finger in there too long at 100 watts per square centimeter or my skin will start to melt. Okay? Now, it turns out at less than about 300 watts per square centimeter. Does every, anybody know on a log scale where 300 is between 10 to, the, 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 3rd? On a log scale? This is your remedial math. Halfway, right? Because 3 squared is 9. This is an order of magnitude. On a linear scale, on a logarithmic scale, 3 is halfway between 1 and 10. Right? Actually, 3.1 is halfway, but nonetheless. Um, Square root of 10 is 3.1 something. Anyway, at above 300, at about 300 watts per square centimeter, if I took a flame and held it in um, on a piece of steel and just held it in that spot stationary long enough, I should just start to melt the steel. Below that, I'll be able to carry the heat away, and I'm going to demonstrate that for you in a little bit. Okay, either today or tomorrow. Um, at a thousand watts per square centimeter, you're getting into an oxyacetylene flame. And I didn't bring an oxyacetylene torch, but people use oxyacetylene torches for welding all the time. And that's about a thousand watts per square centimeter. This is in your notes somewhere, so you, you guys really don't have to take notes. I mean, get out of your old school. Stay in that mode for your other MIT courses, okay? Taking notes. But just, just sit there and sit back and learn to absorb, okay? Don't, don't be distracted by, I'm going to be quizzed, and so therefore I have to take notes. That's what that handout is for. And in fact, you have in that handout this. It's about halfway through, which is a little packet that has this exact same graph on it. Okay? Um, so in any case, 1,000 watts per square centimeter oxyacetylene flames, it's not too hard to melt steel, but it takes a few seconds. I get to 10 of the 4th, and that's an electric arc, okay? And that's what we do most of our welding in the world. Fusion welding is done with electric arcs at 10 to the 4th watts per square centimeter. 10 to the 5th, we actually have something called resistance welding I'll talk about a little bit later. And 10 to the 6th and above, we have electron beam and laser welding, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about, the things that are on this graph for the next 10 or 12 hours. And we're going to go through this. But from a fundamental heat flow, and what do I mean by fundamental heat flow? Anybody know what Fourier's law of heat conduction is? Anyone ever heard of it before? Yes, and? You don't remember. That's okay. Okay. The heat flux is equal to minus K, which is thermal conductivity of the material times the gradient of temperature with distance. This happens to be units of watts per square centimeter is equal to minus the thermal conductivity delta T delta X. If you want to get out of calculus and go to algebra, that's watts per square centimeter. If I have less than 300 watts per square centimeter, I can't get a delta T hot enough to melt steel. Okay? It doesn't really matter what X is. The steel has enough thermal conductivity to, conductivity to carry the heat away. And in fact, if I tried to melt copper, which has got about four or five times the thermal conductivity of steel, I probably have, I have a hard time doing it with an oxyacetylene flame. Copper or aluminum would be hard to do. I really need two or three three thousand watts per square centimeter, but an electric arc, I can melt them within a fraction of within a second or even a fraction of a second, depending on how many amps I have in my in my arc. Okay. With a laser and electron beam at the other end of the spectrum, so down here, I'm not putting the heat in fast enough. The material can just carry the heat away before I'll reach the melting temperature. Okay, and somewhere in there, there's an article that I wrote for the welding handbook that discusses some of this. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, with a laser electron beam, when I get to a million watts per square centimeter in Fourier's first law of heat conduction, I'm putting the heat in so fast 
that the material can't carry it away, and not only do I reach the melting temperature, I reach the vaporization temperature. I start boiling the metal, if you will. It's not really boiling it, but it's vaporizing it so fast that the reactive force of the vapor is coming off so fast, it's like a little mini jet engine in terms of the vapor coming off. It actually digs a hole in the material and gives me a very narrow, I can drill a hole with a laser or an electron beam at 10 to the seventh. And I'll show you that in a little bit, okay? But on this one dimensional graph, I can explain everything about melting by a surface heat source, okay? Isn't that night? Neat. You can go back to the fundamentals and <clears throat> you can explain everything. Now, um, it turns out, we, if we want to just look at the flames at the beginning here, it, whoops, okay. The temperature of a flame and is based on a number of things. One is the enthalpy of the reaction, okay? Certain chemicals burn hotter than others, okay? It turns out, if I look at that handout that I'd shown you before, this is a plot, I wonder if I need to, Steve, you wanna, there's a, on the wall over there, there's a panel, and it'll, you can have room dark, darkening shade, probably on the right white button down there. Uh, no, put the room darkening down. We've got, there you go, just wait, yeah, that's fine, it'll keep coming down. Okay, so this is a lousy plot, but it's, and you but you have it in your handout. It's temperatures degrees centigrade, 2800, 3000, 3200, or is it 28, 29, 3000 degrees centigrade for oxyacetylene flames. And up here you've got, this is the carbon to hydrogen ratio. Up here you have acetylene, propadiene, um, you have propylene, butenes, okay, a number of things. Um, and the formula for some of these things, which if you want to make notes you can, but uh, on some of this that I'm writing down, but acetylene is C2H2. It has a ratio of carbon to hydrogen of one. I did that in my head, right, two over two. Uh, propadiene is C3H4 also known as MAP gas, which no longer is sold, but it was sold until about two years ago in this country. Uh, propylene is C, propadiene, not propadiene, propylene is C2H6, if I remember. It turns out, just straight thermodynamics, any of you ever take chemistry? Some of you are nodding, okay? In chemistry, uh, it turns out carbon will burn hotter than hydrogen. Okay, hydrogen actually burns with an adiabatic flame temperature. If I just put the best ratio of hydrogen oxygen, two to one, and ignited it, the highest temperature I could get is almost 2800 centigrade for pure hydrogen, pure oxygen. You may have done that in high school. Okay, you made a little little explosion in, a, in a, a jar. Acetylene, which has a higher ratio of carbon, carbon actually burns at about 3600, but we're not burning pure carbon, we're burning a one-to-one -one ratio, 50-50, and you'll get about 3,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, or centigrade, with acetylene. And so we're gonna talk about acetylene later, and why we use it, and when we use uh, propylene and MAP for cutting, uh, flame cutting and things. But in fact, the first thing we need to know is if we want to know the temperature of a flame, what's the enthalpy of the reaction? How much heat, how much chemical heat is released when we burn this fuel? We then also need to know the stoichiometry. Do we have the right ratio of hydrogen to oxygen? And we need to know if we have any inerts left over, such as nitrogen, okay? If I have nitrogen, 
the nitrogen is just carried along as baggage. And I gave you a copy of, uh, actually, I told you, you know, to pick one up, but it turns out there's one in the packet too in black and white. But this is my World Trade Center paper, okay? About three weeks after the World Trade Center, an editor, metallurgical editor, asked me if I'd write an article. And I was so sick of hearing people say that the steel melted in the fire. You know, it's all over the news, you know. And I knew it wasn't true, okay? Because I teach combustion. If I could melt steel that easily, then we didn't need Sir Henry Bessemer in 1856 to teach us how to me melt steel and bring us into the steel age, okay? You can't melt, melt steel even, you can barely melt it with an oxyacetylene flame, and you certainly can't melt it in the air. And this our article actually goes through the combustion and the enthalpy reaction and the fact I have nitrogen in the air which lowers the 3000 degrees centigrade temperature of acetylene and if I was talking about fuel gases at 2800 centigrade, you know, gasoline, aviation fuel, at, in pure oxygen it might burn at 2800 centigrade but in, um, in air with four moles of nitrogen for every mole of oxygen it's going to be burning at about 2,000 degrees. And I can prove that to you right now. Because I have some MAP gas. They don't sell it anymore, but I have, some, I have a number of bottles in my office. And this should have a, okay. What's with this? Okay, there we go. New torches. Uh oh. Oh. Gotta turn it on again. Now, this is probably not approved by the MIT Safety Office to be doing this in a classroom. But this is a steel welding wire. This is propane, C3H8. This is MAP, C3H4. I'm going to put a piece of steel in here at the same time. Which one goes red hottest first? C3, C3H4, the map gas, and I can hold it here all day long and I will not melt the steel. Okay? I might oxidize it away to nothing. Okay? But, and I might soften it. Okay, but I won't melt it. Here, hold that until it cools off long enough. I don't want to put it on the table and start a fire. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> then they really would get upset with me. Um, so the enthalpy of the reaction makes a difference. This is a hotter flame. I can melt steel much, much faster with a map gas torch. I can solder faster with a map gas torch than I can with a propane torch. 90% of the map gas cylinders are used by professional plumbers, but they no longer sell it. There was one firm in Chicago that made it, and they got shut down by the EPA about two years ago. And so now if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll buy, still buy a yellow cylinder, but it'll be propylene, C386, okay? Because no one makes C3H4 anymore. I got about 10, 12 cans to stockpile, okay? But plumbers use it because they can solder the joints twice as fast with higher heat intensity. And you saw, I just demonstrated higher heat intensity based on the enthalpy of the reaction. I didn't really necessarily have great stoichiometry control. The stoichiometry control, if I take this apart, see all these little holes here? It's not for light weighting. There actually is a little, a little hole in here, a little orifice, and the gas comes shooting out of there at near the speed of sound. It's called choked flow of the gas. And that's how you meter the gas coming out of here. These things will run for about three hours. If you turn one on and just let it go, it's got about 10 cubic feet of gas equivalent as a liquid, and it'll go for about three hours before it burns itself out, okay? And if you hold it upside down when it's almost burned itself out, you can get liquid come out, and then you get flares, and people get burnt. Oh, well, never mind. Um, 
it tells you not to hold it upside down. So the inert gases, if you're burning in air or whether you're burning in pure oxygen, makes a difference. Now the combustion turns out the before I put that up, the surface heating of a gas by flames is sometimes called the combustion intensity. Now you have to be careful. If you're running a bo boiler and these guys start talking about combustion intensity, they're really talking about um, watts per cubic meter or cubic centimeter because they're, they got a boiler of so many cubic meters and they want to know how many watts I'm generating per cubic meter inside my great big boiler. But if you're talking surface heating, which is only about 10% of the literature on, on flames, it's watts per square centimeter, just like Fourier's first law. And the heating value of the gas in joules per cubic meter times the gas velocity is what's called the combustion intensity. The higher the temperature of the gas and the faster I bring it to the surface, the greater the heat on the surface. Okay? And that's going to, this heating value is proportional to the temperature, burning temperature of the gas, the adiabatic flame temperature. And the gas velocity is also proportional to the temperature because the gas velocity, I'm essentially shooting this gas out and expanding it. The velocity is created by the PDV work of the burning gas. So it's temperature times temperature. This is proportional to temperature. This is proportional to temperature. If I have proportional to temperature times temperature, the combustion temperature goes as T squared, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but it turns out that a flame is controlled. Maybe I got it out of order here. Well, surface heating by the flame is controlled by gas boundary layer at the interface, okay? If I got some gas coming through a tube here, like this tube right here, and the gas hits the surface, it goes off to the side, and if you'll learn how many of you had boundary layers. You're all going to have it before you graduate. You're going to be sick of boundary layers, okay? Uh, but because there's boundary layers on flow, anytime you're flowing something like a ship through water, there's going to be boundary layers that creates drag and things like that, okay? Anyway, there's a gas boundary layer, and there's a free stream velocity, and then at the boundary, the, the velocity has to drop to zero. They have the, what they call the no-slip condition on the solid boundary. And so you have a gas boundary layer, and the heat has to diffuse across this boundary layer. In order to do that, I lose some of the efficiency, and it turns out that the, the, the combustion intensity, this is a theoretical amount of heat that I've got coming out of that tube, but only 2 to 10% <coughs> of that heat actually gets into the steel. 90 to 98% of the heat is just blown off to the side. It's used to heat up the welder, the guy doing the welding. Okay? Welding is a hot and dirty work. Okay? <coughs> so far as that goes. So, the theoretical heat flux, which is the combustion intensity, if I look at the heating value of the gas and gas velocity, the rate at which I'm bringing it to the surface most of that is wasted heat. It's very inefficient so far as that goes. Okay. <coughs> now, what do I do to try to get better efficiency? And this is one of the reasons I handed out the World Trade Center paper because there's several different types of flames and I actually go through that. I sometimes describe the World Trade Center paper as what can you say about a subject when you know nothing about it, at all about it. And this article that I wrote three weeks after the World Trade Center became for a while the most cited article on the World Trade Center. I think it's now number two. If you go Google WTC collapse, it might be number three now. Uh, but it became very popular and infamous at the same time, uh, in part because I wrote it so a good high school science student could understand what's going on. Okay, I tried to keep it simple, but I talked about different types of flames and what they're 
temperatures are, same types of things I'm talking about here. Um, maybe a little more compactly than I'm doing it right now. But there's three types of flames. One's a diffuse flame, one's a premix flame, and the other's a jet burner. In a diffuse flame, you have fuel and oxygen, and they both come out, but they come out and they just sort of mix together, or you just have fuel shooting out. This, if, if we just had fuel shooting out without the, if I, well, maybe I haven't tried this before. If I cover up these holes, it's not working very well, okay. Okay, well I'll have to do something to try, to, oh, I got holes down here. I can't, do, can't hold them all, okay, closed. But if I, if I kept the oxygen from mixing, I would end up with a very yellow flame, incomplete combustion, soot particles all through the flame. But if I have a, a diffuse flame and the fuel and the oxygen have to mix together, I'll get a nice yellow flame. How many of you have gas stoves at home? Okay. Have you ever seen it? It comes out as a nice blue flame because that happens to be a pre-mixed flame. If things are messed up, you can see a yellow flame. Or even if you've got a propane grill at home, if things are messed up and it doesn't mix the air coming, the air with the fuel coming in before it burns, it won't be a nice blue flame, it'll be a nice yellow flame because you've got a lot of soot in there. So with a pre-mixed flame, you have the fuel and the oxygen and you mix them together and shoot them out and you have constant pressure burning and you get one to a hundred times the velocity of a diffuse flame, okay? I mean, if I were to light a match, you'd see a yellow flame, okay? This is a pre-mixed flame. It's coming out as a jet, whereas the, the match is a diffuse flame. Your fireplace is a diffuse flame. Your stove is a pre-mixed flame. This is a pre-mixed flame, okay? And so you get one to a hundred times the velocity, which means you get a higher uh, combustion intensity. And the last type of flame is a jet burner. In a jet burner, the, the premixed flame was a constant pressure flame. You let everything out in the air and you burn it in the air at constant pressure. A jet burner, you mix and ignite inside a closed volume. This is a constant volume flame for the youth thermodynamics people. You do things at constant pressure or you do them at constant volume. A jet burner, you mix and ignite in a constant volume and it comes shooting out with five or ten times the velocity of a premixed flame, which is 500 to 1,000 times the velocity of a, a diffuse flame. So you get lots more velocity, okay? And because of constant volume burning, because you're getting all your thermal expansion in here and shooting out the hole at a, uh, at a very high rate. Now, it turns out that uh, we're going to learn that arcs are nothing more than electrically augmented flames. One way that we can go even better than a jet burner is to use an electric arc and actually pass current through that boundary layer. Okay. So why don't we take a 10 minute break here, or wait a second, you guys, oh yeah, you got about an hour, right? Why don't we take a 10 minute break, because you got an hour before you're 9.20 or 9.15, right? So the restrooms are out here, and I'll <coughs> get some water. <coughs> the World Trade Center is sort of a aside. I, <coughs> I wrote the article, it didn't take long to write the article and it has drawn more interest than anything else I've ever written. <clears throat> it's still wrong, uh, you know, the, their theory. But okay, you ready? Okay. So we were talking about pre-mixed flames and, and such things. Um, and somewhere in here, gotta find it again, is a, uh, let's go back to this heat intensity plot that I had earlier, but I'm going to do it a little bit, here it is, <coughs> a little bit differently. So this is the same one-dimensional heat intensity plot. Let me open this up, it's a little dark. Okay. Um, watts per square centimeter, 10 to the third, 10 to the sixth. Those three orders of magnitude 
will have all fusion welding proceeds. So we have oxyacetylene, we have friction welding, we have arc welding, we have resistance welding, which I haven't talked about, laser and electron beam over here. If you go to the 10 to the 7th, you're just going to drill holes. You won't, you won't fill the holes back in with molten metal. You just vaporize everything away. If you're less than 10 to the 3rd, you won't even melt the metal. So everything has to fall on those in that area. Now, <coughs> um, it turns out with that simple concept, you can come up with a number of other things, such as as you go from your left to right across here, you will have decreasing heat affected zone size as you go across here. And that's why I brought, I don't have a, a good laser weld, but this is actually a piece of HY80 welded about 30 years ago at electric boat and you can actually see the heat affected zone um, you can sort of see it here um, I'll pass it around but here's the weld in here and this little black area on the side is the heat affected zone so you can pass that around here's another weld which I think we did for a oil field blowout and it's a, an arc weld as well and I guess that one's not, it's, it's, this one's been polished and so it doesn't show up quite as well but you'll see the heat affected zone around the, the molten metal there. Um, it turns out there is a heat intensity or a process that produces about 10 of the fifth watts per square centimeter and that's resistance spot welding and I'll talk about that in a little bit but basically it's used in automobiles um, extensively for putting together the steel sheet metal so these two pieces of galvanized steel you, you put them together you bring in two copper electrodes at about 10,000 psi pressure you pass about 10,000 amps for about a third of a second and you just melt the inside Okay, you form a little button. Uh, the guy who invented this was L. Hugh Thompson, a professor of electrical engineering at MIT. He was president of MIT for one year. Uh, he started a company with a guy named Thomas Edison uh, right up here in Lynn, Massachusetts called General Electric. Okay, uh, but Thomas Edison had about 400 patents. He had more patents than anybody else. L. Hugh Thompson had about 380. He was number two in patents at the time. Um, <coughs> around the 1890s or so. Anyway, so Elihu Thompson um, sort of invented resistance spot welding. Uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about it, but I uh, have a lecture on it um, that I sometimes give. And I point out that they put about 3,000 spot welds in the average automobile because you need 2,000 good ones. Okay? Uh, they're not they're easy to make, cost about a nickel to make a spot weld in an automobile. And if there's 3,000 spot welds at a nickel a piece, what's that, $150 or something? Um, so it's not all that expensive. In the aerospace industry, they spot weld the combustor cans on the jet engine. Those welds probably cost about $3 a piece to make because there's lots of quality control that goes in to the combustor cans on a jet engine. It's a little more critical than just having a rattle in your door after a few years. Um, and so they, ha they have a lot more uh, uh, quality control that goes with it. Um, but in any case, um, I figured one time that General, General Motors probably makes 50 billion spot wells a year, so far as that goes. So there's decreasing heat affected zone size, and there's a paper, I mentioned it briefly before in your handout, <coughs> an article that I wrote that basically tells you what types of um, well the heat affected zone one is right over here so this is the range of width of heat affected zone as a function of heat source intensity 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th and a lot of people will say that the size of the heat affected zone in a laser electron beam weld goes down to zero but that's not true okay uh, in fact, you'll find that, it says that in the welding handbook. But I've sort of made a career out of going to welding um, conferences and knocking what it says in the welding handbook as being wrong. If you look at the temperature versus time, 
for a welding thermal cycle on a traveling weld it looks something like this and this is this might be the melting point and it takes a certain amount of time to rise up to the melting point you'll be melted for a certain amount of time then it will solidify you're melted in this region in here and it doesn't really matter you can prove that in a dimensional analysis you'll always have this general shape whether you're at 10 to the third or 10 to the uh, um, six watts per square centimeter you have heating and cooling but obviously at higher heat intensities this thing shrinks down in time to a very narrow value uh, something that might look like this okay and the difference is the heat affected zone size in an oxyacetylene weld grows while the material is heating okay and it also does that in an arc weld but in a laser electron beam weld you actually melt the material so quickly that it's the time that it takes the heat to diffuse into the material that the heat effect zone grows and so the heat effect zone grows on cooling in lasers and electron beams so in a oxyacetylene weld or an arc weld the heat effect zone gets smaller and smaller as you go to higher heat intensity but then when you kind of cross the peak and the heat effect zone is growing over the time that it cools you don't get a smaller heat effect zone because the heat effect zone is roughly equal to the width of the weld zone okay you put all this molten metal there instantaneously almost and then it has to soak into the surrounding material so you don't get rid of heat effect zones <coughs> now I once saw <coughs> as at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and uh, <coughs> they showed me a picture of a weld we were talking about convection in weld pools and stirring of the metal and stuff and they showed me a cross-section of a piece of metal in a weld there was no heat affected zone and I said what, what type of material is this I don't see the heat affected zone and they just kept on talking and I asked the question four or five times and they kept on talking and finally I pinned them down we would finished most of what they questions they had for me I said what material is this and they said well it's plutonium <laughs> okay turns out plutonium has very very low thermal conductivity and so the heat doesn't soak into the plutonium like it does into steel or aluminum so the heat affected zone will be deeper in aluminum or copper which has good thermal conductivity and something that has almost no thermal conductivity that's an insulator will have a very small heat affected zone so next time you're welding plutonium okay remember you don't have to worry as much about the heat affected zone <clears throat> but in any case the heat affected zone is controlled by the heat flux uh, it's just a question of when so on heating or on cooling um, you have as you go across from your left to right you have increasing travel speed and that's what this plot is heat intensity versus the whoops interaction time seconds one over okay the the travel speed would be one over the interaction time there's a certain amount of time as you're sweeping this traveling heat source over the surface of the material there's a certain amount of time that it is it takes to go past its spot size <clears throat> and this would be the travel speed this would be the interaction time in lasers and electron beams I may be going at a uh, hundred inches a second a hundred inches a minute okay whereas oxyacetylene I might be going at one or two inches a minute so I have to I go slower with oxyacetylene than I do with lasers and electron beams now it turns out about 25 years ago I actually was one of the people who pointed out in the welding community why um, we often train people with oxyacetylene welding rather than arc welding any of you ever taken any welding classes in high, in high school they train you on oxyacetylene or arc welding oxyacetylene a lot of times they start with oxyacetylene anybody else yeah you started with arc was it high school okay did someone else raise their hand okay 
Okay. In any case, about a half to a third of the time they start you with oxyacetylene. Um, other times they start you with an arc. Um, typically, if it's going to be something that you have to learn within about a week, they'll start you right off with an arc. Uh, but if it's something where you have a whole semester to learn how to do it, they will start you off with oxyacetylene. It all has to do with your reaction time. Anybody ever played a video game? You don't start out the video game on the highest speed, you start out at the slower speeds. And the interaction time for an oxyacetylene weld, the time to, for that weld pool to heat up is seconds before you melt. Okay? And in seconds, you can, your reaction time is pretty good. Anyone ever played the beer game of, of uh, trying to catch George Washington's nose in a bar? This is basically, you, you take a dollar bill and you bet someone that if you drop the dollar bill and they have their fingers as close as they can to George's nose, that they can't catch it when you drop it. If they do, they get to keep it. Okay, and, you know, so you can do this betting game. And now I can do it every time because my right hand knows what my left hand's doing, right? But if we're actually doing it with another person, it turns out it's about, I calculated it once, about 0.12 seconds to drop that distance. What's the typical reaction time? You go over here to the Museum of Science, they have a little thing, the light goes on, you hit a button. Typical reaction time's 0.2 for most people. It's not 0.12. It might be uh, point, uh, um, you wanna do it? <laughs> Now you owe me a hundred if you get it, no. if you don't get it. Okay, so this is, this is Ben's nose. Oh, sorry, let's try that again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can't do it unless you cheat, okay? Now I've done it a number of times with students, and if it's a hot day and my fingers are sweating, the students have caught it because there's a little adhesive bonding of the moisture. That's, that's the adhesive bonding lecture. But if you have a little moisture on your hands, it might stick. Okay, so I had students catch the hundred. Okay, <coughs> they always gave it back. Anyway, they hadn't gotten their grade yet. Um, <laughs> in any case, this heat intensity controls the interaction time, the spot size, the well pool size, uh, a number of different things. Okay, um, so increasing heat efficiency. At 10 to the third, you, well, oops, better go back down. Well, at 10 to the third, you have, we already said, somewhere between 90 and 98% of your heat is rejected as hot gases. You only have 2 to 10% efficiency in terms of melting of metal with the heat you're generating in the flame. Okay? Arc welding, <coughs> there's lots of ways to define it but you're typically at 30 to 50 percent efficiency. You get here over at laser and electron beam, you can be at 99 percent heat efficiency in terms of the heat you're generating going into melting metal. Okay? In the arc welding, a lot of your heat is just heating up the heat affected zone. But in laser and electron beam, you don't have that wasted heat to preheat the heat affected zone because you just melt everything almost all at once and then the heat affected zone grows on cooling, that's not wasted heat, okay? So there's a difference in heat efficiency from about 10% to 100% going across here. There's an increasing need to automate, okay? Um, the reason you started with um, oxyacetylene in high school, you had weeks to play with this and you could eventually get to arc welding. Did you ever get to arc welding? Okay. It turns out, as you're watching that puddle, you learn, just like in a video game, what to look for and what to respond to. And if the reaction time is on the order of a second or two seconds, that's the slow speed on the video game when you're doing oxyacetylene. You get to arc welding and you can prove that the interaction time is on the order of a few tenths of a second, which means You've got, you're getting on the higher skill level of the, of the video game and you've got to, you know, <coughs> um, really pay attention 
and it's harder to learn, start out learning in the middle level of the video game with arc welding. But if they only got a week to teach you, they don't have time and they'll just allow you to make lousy welds without, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but at, you know, to a certain extent, how much time do you want to spend? But in increasing a need to uh, automate, when I get here at the laser electron beam, no one is taking a hand torch in laser welding that I know of. You have interaction times down here on the less than a tenth of a second, maybe 10 millisecond time scale that if you don't move that beam every 10 milliseconds to the next spot, you're just going to burn a hole and melt through. Too much heat in one spot. No person can control that. So it turns out you have to automate when you get over here to laser and electron beam. It's just there's nothing else to it. You have to do it. And that leads to increasing equipment cost. It's not so much that the, la the electron beam or the laser are so expensive, it's all the automation and material handling that goes with it. So it turns out I can set up to do oxyacetylene welding for about a thousand dollars. I mean I can go down here to welding supply place, buy a couple of tanks, a uh, tank of oxygen, I mean the tank, not just rent the tank, buy the cylinder, buy the acetylene cylinder, buy a torch, for $1,000 I can be in the oxyacetylene business. For $10,000 I can be in the arc welding business. For a million I can be in the laser and electron beam business. Not that the laser and electron beam cost me a million, they may only, may only cost me $100,000, but in fact all the automation equipment that goes with it ups the price. So it turns out instead of watts per square centimeter, I could change that with dollars per capital cost of equipment, which is something I did about 20, 25 years ago. <coughs> cost of welding, capital equipment cost in dollars, 10 to the third, productivity, centimeters of weld per second. This is the maximum speed. So I may only be able to do two inches or two and a half, let's see, a minute, okay? I may only be able to do two or three inches a minute with an oxyacetylene torch. With an arc, I can do 10 centimeter or 60 centimeters a minute. That's kind of the highest speed with, a, with an arc. With laser electron beam, I can do 100 centimeters per second. Okay? And we might talk about some of those things. Resistance welding, on the other hand, has an effective speed and cost which is significantly less. So why does General Motors use resistance welding to put automobiles together? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but one is cost and productivity. Making lots of welds, it's cheaper than laser and electron beam, okay? On a per unit length of weld basis, significantly cheaper, okay? And the capital cost of the equipment, you can just replace the watts per square centimeter with um, dollars per, capital equipment. Um, there's increasing depth to width ratio. If I look at an oxyacetylene weld at 10 to the third, I'll get a very shallow, did they ever cro have you cross section the welds and polish them so you can etch them so you can see how deep the penetration was? Did you ever do that? Oh, okay. Sometimes in teaching students, they'll have them do that. But an oxyacetylene weld, you might have a depth to width, ra width ratio of three to five, okay? Uh, or actually it'd be one third to one fifth if it's depth to width, right? The depth is not very great compared to the width, okay? With arc welding, you can look at those arc welds I just passed around. It's about depth to width ratio of one, okay? because it's more of a point heat source. The flame is a distributed heat source. The arc is really concentrated there in the center, and so ideally it's a semicircle. It's not really a semicircle. There's convection going on in the pool and stuff. But a laser and electron beam, I can get well pools that have depth to width of 10 to 50. Now it turns out we're gonna when we talk about it, we never want to get more than about 10. 
but you can get 50 in the laboratory, okay? You just can't fit things together reliably in the field with a ratio of 10 to 50. And all of a sudden, your alignment problems get to be horrendous, okay? Um, <clears throat> and the last one is increasing production volume requirements. Oops, let's move it up, okay? <clears throat> if I'm going to be making 100 centimeters a second of weld, okay, I got to have a lot of material to weld, right? And as a result, uh, electron beam is used in two industries, basically, and laser to a certain extent. Lasers use a little few more industries. But electron beam is used in two industries. Anybody know which ones use electron beam? Fairly, I mean, 98% of the equipment is sold into two industries. Automotive, we have tremendous volume. The catalytic converters a few years ago on Fords, where you got two pieces of stainless steel that come together like a clamshell, and you got your ceramic filter on the inside. That seam between the clamshell, between the two pieces of stainless steel coming together, that seam was electron beam welded. They had six electron beam welders at Ford that were sealing up these catalytic converters. And it may not have been 100 centimeters a second, but it was probably 60 centimeters a second because they got millions of these things to make. And you start figuring out on how many shifts a year and how many inches and how many, you know, of weld you've got to make. If they did that in gas tungsten and arc welding at 10 centimeters, they'd have have 60 machines, okay? Or at one two or three centimeters, they may have to have 200 machines. Now the capital cost is in favor of the very high productivity electron beam welder. Now they, we might talk about it when we get to electron beam. They actually used out of vacuum electron beam, which was a maintenance nightmare, but we can talk about that later. Um, the uh, um, what was I going to say about oh production volume? The other industry, the other industry is aerospace. Go up here to GE Lynn. Well, I don't think you can do this anymore because they're closing it down now. But they used to weld together two turbine discs. Okay, I was I was called up there in the mid '80s by a guy I'd worked with. I actually had a resistance spot welding contract with General Electric. I spent the mid-80s over in Tokyo, Japan with the U.S. Office of Naval Research uh, as a liaison scientist. But right before I left, General Electric came to me and said, we'd like to give you a research contract on spot welding of these combustor cans for our, our aircraft engines. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was the whipping boy for General Electric Research in Schenectady, in New York. They had been working for five or six years uh, on um, SWAC, uh, SWAT, Spot Welding Adaptive Control. And General Electric Research had spent seven million dollars developing this spot welding adaptive control technology. While I was off in Japan, I had a postdoc and a, and a graduate student who were working on this project and they showed that this process was not working at all, okay? Uh, General Electric Research in Schenectady had blown $7 million and had nothing to show for it, okay? So what they had happened is they're supposed to spend their money with General Electric Research rather than going off and giving it to some stupid university. But they decided to cut out, the managers up here at Lynn decided to cut out General Electric Research and give a portion of the money they would have given to them to me. They were giving over a million dollars a year to them and they gave me like $40,000 to do some work, or $50,000, I don't remember. It was a lot less, but we're cheaper, right? But we actually showed that their, their control algorithm, which had to control within a tenth of a second, actually didn't even start measuring until about two tenths of a second. So the weld was already over before it was adaptively controlling the weld, okay? Kind of hard to adaptively control when the process is already over, but nonetheless, but because when I got back and we were working on this, and I was hoping to get the next year's funding from General Electric, and I had sort of learned about I was being the whipping boy for General Electric Research um, to get them in, in line. 
the engineer called me up and he says, uh, Tom, we got a problem with uh, electron beam welding of our titanium compressor cases. So these are like $30,000, you know, rings of, pla of titanium, okay? And they want to weld them together with an electron beam circumferential weld about a half an inch thick. And they do it in this big electron beam chamber about half the size of this room. And uh, they put the two in there and they would run the electron beam weld and they were getting pores in their titanium welds, por porosity. And you would, you're supposed to take two of these $30,000 units and weld them together. Now it's a seventy dollars or $80,000 unit. I mean, there's a lot of value added here. And if you make a bad weld, you now have scrap. So the loss is about $60,000 loss or a $20,000 gain, you know, if you actually uh, make a good product. And I, I told the engineer at General Electric, I said, Lyle, what are they using to clean it? He said, acetone. I said, oh, okay. Why don't you go and get some reagent grade acetone and have them start cleaning it with reagent grade acetone? And he says, okay. Well, about five, six weeks later, he calls me back up. He says, Tom, we, we, uh, we're still getting porosity. And I was wondering if you could come up and look at our process. And I said, um, yeah, what happened when you used the reagent grade acetone? Well, we haven't tried that yet. Okay. Oh, okay. And by the way, Tom, um, we don't, this is an old engine project. We don't have an account number to charge your time to. So I was kind of hoping you'd come up for free since we have this other spot welding contract. I said, oh, okay. So I agreed. I went up there at 7 o'clock one morning. They walked me through the whole cleaning process. And then we went into the uh, uh, room where the electron beam was. And they had a couple of these they were going to put together. At that point, I counted them. 19 engineers or technicians from General Electric showed up. I don't know what account number they were charging their time to. Okay, But I know that no one does anything up there unless they have an account number to charge to. But they didn't have any money to pay me, but these other 19 people were all very interested in this. And so they got these two things and the two surfaces before they put them together and put them in the machine. And I said, can I look at it? And I took a little 10x loop magnifier. And I'm looking at the surface to see how clean it is. And um, as I'm looking at it, I go back to another area and I notice there are little white spots that were not there when I looked at it 15 seconds ago. And I kind of look around and I realize it's raining dust in this room, okay? And that's all you need is a little dust spot or a fingerprint, okay? Originally, I was looking to see if there were fingerprints, but people were using white gloves and everything, and the guy just wiped it down with the acetone and stuff. Um, and I asked him, where are you getting the acetone? Oh, we got a 55-gallon drum out back, okay. Um, and... I'm looking at it, I said, oh, hey, there's dust that's falling out of the air. And the, the technician who's supposed to be putting this together, he starts fussing with, well, I would have had them together by now if you hadn't been, if you hadn't interrupted what I was doing, you know. Oh, so it's my fault that they're getting dusty, right? So at that point, everybody decided I was just a klutz and creating more problems. So they put it together. In the meantime, I found a little glass slide over on the table and I cleaned it off with my handkerchief so it was nice and clean. And I took some of that squirt bottle of acetone and I squirted it on the glass slide. And I blew on it to evaporate the acetone. Everybody else is looking at the guy loading the thing and ignoring me at this point. And I dried off the acetone. You could look and you could see Newton's rings. People know what ne Newton's rings are? If you have oil slick on water, you actually see these rainbow of colors. Those are Newton's rings. Okay, If you have a thin film of grease on water, or in this case on a glass slide, then you'll actually see these colors. Okay, This was a clean glass slide. I had evaporated the acetone. This 55-gallon drum of acetone was industrial-grade acetone. It wasn't reagent-grade acetone. And in fact, it had oil in it. It's not uncommon. I don't know. Most Industrial-grade acetone probably has 1 or 2% oils in it, grease. It's a, it's a grease solvent, okay? That's what you use it for. And if you just buy industrial grade, it's not really very clean. So 
they get it all put together and it's going to take half an hour for the vacuum system to pump down the chamber before they can make the weld. It's now 11 and Lyle says, well, why don't we go to the cafeteria and get some lunch? So he and I go over to the cafeteria. Everybody else decided, like I said, decided I was a klutz and they went back to work because they couldn't keep charging on this account. We have lunch and we come back and they had a leak in the vacuum system so it still hadn't pumped down and I said, Lyle, let me know how it comes out. I'm not hanging around anymore today. So after lunch, I, I went back to came back to MIT. And about two months later, Lyle calls me up and he's, oh, before I left, I said, Lyle, get rid of this industrial grade acetone. Get some reagent grade acetone and clean it off with a reagent grade acetone. So this time he did. And two months later, I get a, get a, call, a phone call from him. He's all upset because he had used the reagent grade acetone and the porosity went away because they weren't covering it with grease. Okay, and he was upset because all he got, they had welded six of these in the last two months and they had projected a cost savings of half a million dollars a year and all he got was a letter of commendation. And I said, Lyle, I didn't even get a letter. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so there's a couple of morals to that story. I tell you, I like, like to tell stories. <coughs> The fix is often a simple fix. You actually have to try the fix to see if it'll work. If you don't try it, it doesn't work. It's sort of a given, okay? Um, but I don't even know what the, all the others are. You can figure out your other, mor your other morals <laughs> to that story. Um, but I could give you other stories about General Electric and other companies about, they just don't even, they don't even want to try it, okay? They want to keep on doing it the same way. And you know the definition of stupidity, right? doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? Anyway, um, so it turns out in the aerospace industry we have, we use electron beam welding and laser welding because it can give us faster, deeper, smaller heat affected zone, less residual stress welds. In the automotive industry we do it because we need, we have enough material to feed the beast, okay? In aerospace welding, that electron beam unit may only be on 2% of the week, okay? But you need it because there's no other way to make that joint. And the value of the parts you're putting together, you can easily pay for that capital cost of that equipment because of the high value added of the, of the parts, okay? So let's take the last couple of minutes here since you're in the Navy and you're interested in welding ships, among other things. Then you are interested in turbine blades and other things in different cases. So why don't we use laser and electron beam in the shipyard for welding? You don't have the production vo volume requirements, right? You don't have the value added of an aerospace component most of the time. Sometimes the Navy does. And sometimes they use laser welding and stuff. Um, the Navy has an applied physics research lab at Penn State University, okay, where they do all kinds of work on laser processing. Uh, they, the Navy had the first 25 kilowatt non-classified uh, laser welder in the country back in the mid-70s at the Naval Research Laboratory. Because everybody wanted to use laser, high-power lasers, which were coming into their own in the early 70s, for um, improve productivity. But in fact, if you don't have either a very high value added part, like an aerospace part, or high volume that you can just keep feeding in there, then it turns out not to be economical. And it's been proved over and over again. But you're still gonna have some manager who comes and says, oh, why don't we use laser welding, okay? One of my first students was hired by AFCO Everett. If you go over here to be, uh, to Costco over in Everett. Uh, across from there, there's BN, BNY Mellon Bank, this big building. That building used to be the Avco Everett Research Facility. And they used to build these 25 kilowatt lasers like the one that they sold to the Naval Research Lab. One of my students went to work there back in the early 80s. And his job was to see if he could have the laser working when the customer came by for the demonstration. Because 90% of the time it wasn't working was really a research machine. 
Now today, you know, 30 years later, lasers are more reliable. But it's still a problem of the capital cost of the equipment versus do you have enough material to put in it. I can give you another example of um, high power electron beam uh, laser well, uh, high power electron beam welding, and that's bandsaw blades. Anybody ever go to the Home Depot and more expensive bandsaw blades or hexaw blades or bimetal blades? Anybody know what that means? Not bimetal, not BUI, but BI metal. Okay, bimetallic blades. <coughs> so a bimetallic blade. <coughs> And this was actually one of the first. I think this goes back to the like 1940s or 1950s for electron beam technology, which was really new at that time. A bimetal blade, you got a, a bandsaw blade, and it's got teeth on it that look sort of like this, right? And you'd like the base steel to be spring steel which is hardened and very springy, okay? Got a lot of stiffness to it. You'd like the tips to be a high speed steel with molybdenum or tungsten or other very expensive alloying elements in it because these maintain their, temp their strength at high temperatures. So there actually used to be a firm out here in Western, I think it's Springfield, Massachusetts. And they had a vacuum system with an electron beam. And they would feed in a little strip about two millimeters wide of this high speed steel with a piece of spring steel. And they would weld this together right here. And then they would grind the teeth on the high speed steel. And so when you buy a bimetallic blade, it means the tips are the expensive steel, and the backing, which is just, just there to give you stiffness and to hold the tips, if you will, is the cheap steel. So it's like getting a very, very expensive steel for the cost of a low-cost low, uh, low steel. And in fact, this steel on the tips has very good high temperature strength, but it doesn't have the same type of fracture and fatigue strength as, as this steel. So you end up with a composite and they're whipping that stuff through at about 100 centimeters, um, well, I don't know if it's 100 centimeters a second, but probably 10 centimeters a second. Just comes through a vacuum feed, vacuum air feed through and goes out a vacuum air feed through, just making reels and reels of this stuff to make bimetallic blades. And you can now buy hacksaw, hacksaw blades that are bimetallic, okay? So there's an example. There are niche applications for these things. So I'll see you tomorrow, and then we'll, we'll do a couple hours a day, um, if that's all right. If you can survive it, I'll try to survive it too. <laughs>